Menno, welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show. What's going on, brother? My pleasure. Well, good here. How about you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. I'm excited for myself, frankly, uh, to have the opportunity to have a chat with you. I'm excited for our listeners as well to be able to provide some context around the science and the psychology of behavior change. And so what I would like to do here, would you mind just giving a, a very brief background about who you are and what it is that you do? Sure. I'm a former business consultant that started off uh, online coaching, basically just writing about fitness. Um, well, that developed super nicely, basically, to the point where I'm now not just coaching people. I still do that part time, but I most of my time I spent on my uh, online PT courses where I teach people how to be better coaches. I mostly specialize in uh, people that are quite serious. I also wrote a book that's very gen pop, and I'm a, I'm a scientist. Like I do exercise science and nutritional sciences, and um, some very side products, public speaking and stuff. But mainly, yeah, I teach people how to take control of their lives and in particular their physique in the aim of personal development, fat loss, muscle growth, strength development. And, and seeing as you have such a, a scientific foundation and psychological foundation for this stuff, what was the impetus to, because you wrote a book, The Science of Self-Control, what was the mm -hmm. impetus to write this book? Well, I've had a lot of these thoughts. It's basically 10 years of notes or something that I compiled in that book and things that I found very useful for myself, but I didn't really have a platform for. So most of my, my social media, my Instagram is very much focused on discussing the latest scientists on exercise science, nutritional scientists. So it's very specific about fitness and also relatively advanced compared to like mainstream fitness channels. So I didn't really have a good platform to post more general self-development stuff. And yeah, basically compiled all of these things into a book. Also merged more of what I learned uh, as a behavioral economist, which is my original training actually, which wasn't about fitness at all, I switched path in my early 20s. And there I learned a lot about, you know, how people make sustainable lifestyle changes, how people, like behavioral psychology in general is about why people do what they do. And understanding that I think is, is crucial to make them change what they do. Because a lot of people, we want to do things differently than we're doing it now. We have bad habits. You know, our lifestyle is not as we would like it, but it's difficult to change these things because a lot of these things happen subconsciously, psychologically. and. Therefore, I think that's a kind of a whole different area that you kind of need to get into before you can explain these concepts well. So a book I found was the better option and trying to put it into a tweet. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's very relevant and obviously something that I think any coach uh, realizes at some point in their journey of working with clients is very quickly becomes far more than just calories in, calories out, and just the type of exercise that we're prescribing. And I, I think it speaks volumes to just the nature of the dieting industry in and of itself and why so many people are lost in this perpetual cycle, right? And so um, part of the reason why I wanted to have you in, on and have this conversation, because I'd, I'd love for you to speak to um, the psychology of behavior change. And, and I guess the, one of the ways that we can start off this conversation is how should we be looking at self-control and willpower in the context of dieting and weight loss. Yeah, the popular view of willpower is that it's like a muscle and it's also like a sort of a, a fuel inside your mind that gradually drains with use. And that's not accurate. It is neither like a muscle in the sense of being trainable. And it is also not like a fuel in the sense that you deplete it and it's, it's gone. Like there is no willpower substrate. And in fact, your willpower is much more closely linked to your happiness. And there was a recent study that shows that dieting, adherence, and happiness strongly correlate, which is also what I argue in my book, that what you're essentially doing with willpower or self-control, self-discipline, these are all kind of the same things. We use different words, but essentially they refer to our, our more rational part of our brain, what we identify as us, like our conscious part of our brain, to control our more primitive, more um, innate, subconscious biases, behaviors, etc., which scientists sometimes call system one, you know, or reptile brain, paleomammalian brain. And so we have these feelings like hunger and we have the idea that we don't want to eat because it doesn't fit our diet. So we have to exert self-control like this part of our brain, the more conscious part has to control the part the, that just says hunger, eat, and that's self-control. And doing this requires focus and 
what the brain essentially does, if you're focusing on these have-to activities, rather than things that you want to do, things that provide instant gratification or pleasure, it, at some point, makes you lose, makes you lose the attention. So when you're focusing excessively on things that don't provide instant gratification, your brain is essentially sabotages your, or cuts off the connection to the, um, what you want to pay attention to. And it's like, hey, here's this uh, Facebook icon. Hey, here's the smell of pizza. And that's what we deem self-control failure. And in that sense, it appears like we have this limited self-control, but it's only limited. For one, there's a very big mindset issue, but also it's only limited when we're doing things that we're not inherently motivated for. Because nobody complains about self-control when we're doing something we love, when we are uh, listening to a podcast, for example, that we love, and it's exactly the topic that we're interested in. You don't lose focus when you're doing something you love. It's only when you're doing things where you have this disconnect between these two sides of your brain that essentially want something different that your conscious brain has to override the usually more primitive uh, brain. So this seems to be especially relevant in the dieting realm, right? Because oftentimes people put themselves in these situations where they don't technically want to be doing whatever it is that they're doing. Like the, the perception of going to the gym and training hard is not appealing to them. The perception of having to avoid all of the cookies right? Or avoiding alcohol mm -hmm. or tracking their calories, right? Therefore, the, in their mind, it requires a high level of, of discipline, a high level of, of, of willpower, high level of self-control, however, however you want to use that term. And therefore, it becomes much more complex to be able to execute on that. Is that correct? Definitely. And that's also where the link with kind of lifestyle coaching comes in, where most coaches feel at some point exactly as you say that, hey, I've designed this optimal program. Uh, but my clients are not following it and it seems like the issues that they are facing are have more to do with like general lifestyle matters than you know how many grams of carbohydrates and what did i consume at dinner last night yeah absolutely so and i want to come back to that um but i i suppose where do you factor in the in terms of uh we'll say compliance for lack of a better term in terms of of success uh, in terms of maybe motivation, perhaps is a better way to look at this in terms of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation and kind of uh, long-term success. I think motivation is very important and trying to cultivate that. And you already touched on extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. That's a very good distinction, I think, to be aware of. Intrinsic motivation is what you are intrinsically drawn towards, things that you naturally want to do. Like, I don't have to motivate you to do this because you're going to do it anyway if left to your own devices. And extrinsic motivation is more utilitarian, goal-oriented. It's something you do to get something else. Like you, if you, do, if you hate your job, for example, you just go to work because you get a paycheck. Like you wouldn't do it if you didn't get the paycheck. But then you're ex more, more extrinsically motivated. And we can cultivate this intrinsic motivation via three big pillars psychological research has found. And those are competence, relatedness, and autonomy. And basically, to like something, we want to get good at it. We want to have our own uh, autonomy, our own control. Like we want to be left to our own devices to pursue what we want to do. We don't want someone telling us you have to do it this. And we especially don't want someone to tell us you have to do this. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you why. And it has to be exactly this way. That's the worst kind of um, right, right. motivation. And then we also want to relate to something. It has to be something that we identify with, something that we care about. It just, it's, you know, it's, if you're... Um, to give a terrible example, if you have family that died of cancer, then you're going to feel more related to helping out a cancer fund, for example, as opposed to a fund about uh, cerebral palsy or something. What have you seen and, and, and perhaps what does the, the research say in terms of um, you know, long-term success and, and, and perhaps even your anecdotal experience working with clients in terms of those that perhaps have a, a strong reason as to why they want to accomplish their physique related goals, their weight loss goals, maybe they're just their overall health goals versus, you know, versus not. I think for fitness, that's kind of relatedness, what I just described, like big life events that influence your motivation is harder to find. But I think it, it's more about aesthetic preferences and having role models. Like I remember at various points in my life, I, had, I, I saw someone, whether it was an actor or uh, I remember one of the first people I saw was uh, Usher. And he had this photo, I was like 14 or something, I guess, at the time. And he, he had this photo where he had like 
mild abs. He wasn't jacked or anything, but he was in, he was in good shape. It just hit me like, I need to look like that. You know, and so we can have these things in terms of role models, but of course they're not going to be as powerful as like life-changing events or anything. Yeah, most definitely. Sometimes it's the extrinsic motivators that can be compelling enough in the initial stages to start to drive the intrinsic motivation is terms of, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, maybe you sign up for a challenge because there's a $500 prize, right? And then you start exercising or you start eating healthier by virtue of the challenge. And then you start to realize how good you felt you feel by virtue of doing that upon which you take it upon yourself, or perhaps it becomes a habit or you start to realize how good you feel and then it's more intrinsically driven. Is that fair? Yes, definitely. And it's, it's about cultivating these three pillars, like cultivating the relatedness, cultivating the competence and cultivating the autonomy. So if, with clients, I think it's very important to, they learn how to do things better. They learn good exercise technique. They understand at least the basic principles of the program and they can do it themselves. Like they don't need you there all, this, all the time to be with them and explain how it works, etc. So they have the autonomy to follow the program and ultimately even the autonomy to proceed on their own probably and they feel there there's something more to it like this, this relatedness is probably the most difficult and i usually cite crossfit as an example of um, uh, organization that fosters relatedness very well like they have separate names for everything they have names for their workouts which happen to be names of like upper class uh, Caucasian women, which is like their, their target audience for a large part. And then their, their gyms are not called gyms, but boxes. And then they have not just a normal diet, but paleo, and they don't train for physique or they, they train for function. So it's very much, it all cultivates more of a spirit. You know, you're a functional, paleo eating, um, self improving human rather than um, a guy that just wants a bigger biceps, you know? Yeah, just bodybuilding or. Mm -hmm jacked and tan or whatever right yeah and bodybuilding can appeal to some people but for a lot of people it's it's relatively empty in terms of the relatedness yeah exactly there's there's definitely a different market there as we see it so you know in in speaking of of self-control in speaking of habit change and speaking of motivation it obviously begs the question of um and and i guess long-term success and compliance it begs the question of reasonable starting points for people because we're obviously both very aware and so is every single person listening to this that calories matter right that mm -hmm. the exercise type matters um that there needs to be a caloric deficit to facilitate weight loss and yet we could justify determining a different starting point on that uh trajectory on that timeline for every single person based on competence, readiness for change, commitment level, pre-existing knowledge. Um, how do you look at that from a coaching standpoint as to what is a reasonable starting point as opposed to just saying, here's your macros, go? Yeah, there's, there's research on this, which basically finds exactly what you say, that the initial degree of commitment should be proportional to their motivation. So the more motivated someone is, the better they do when they go all in. Whereas if someone is not motivated at all, you want to take baby steps. Now, in general, I think research is on the, the side of being a little aggressive at the start. And there was also quite some research that shows people that are successful in the first couple of weeks of the diet have better, even very long-term adherence. Like you want those, those instant results, those instant gains kind of to show that the program is working and that fosters not just uh, the instant results, but it also fosters confidence in the program and the competence, autonomy, etc. that uh, come with that. So I generally err on the side of starting relatively aggressively and research shows that for most people, starting with both nutrition and training at the same time is good. Like so basically shows you don't want to be too much of baby step, which also if you're uh, essentially patronizing your clients too much like you're saying hey we're doing this super slow because i know you're not really into it right that that's really a bad mindset for them because then you're basically saying i don't have faith in you either i don't you don't have faith in you so really we're just gonna try this one step at a time but really not expect anything one of the key words in my coaching approach is empowerment like you want to empower your clients and in that sense, you probably want to push them a bit, especially as a coach, because they came to you. They were, obviously, they, there is a motivation of some kind to really uh, do this, and they put their faith in you. So they 
they must have you know, some confidence and, and faith in whatever you are going to prescribe for them. And you want to capitalize on that to help them get good results in the beginning. And then you have, okay, you have faith in the process. You have shown them that they can do it. And they've already, you've used probably with the time of where they're most motivated to start building the good habits that are going to sustain them in the long run. Yeah, definitely. So it's the, really the art of coaching of figuring out where a good starting point is for them uh, to be able to facilitate it in the most aggressive yet reasonable way for them so that they can uh, get great results right out of the gate, obviously gain trust um, in the process, feel empowered as part of the process. and that ultimately is going to contribute towards uh, better long-term success for them. Mm -hmm. As we're starting to get into the actual coaching process here, and, and as we talk, start to talk a little bit more about caloric control and exercise, I'd love for you to touch on um, flexible versus rigid dietary control and kind of what we're seeing in the literature. Um, and I think how it factors into kind of the, the general dieting sphere that we're in research very strongly favors flexible control over rigid control and people have taken that to mean that flexible dieting is sort of the end all be all of diet adherence but by placing the emphasis on the diet rather than the control it actually kind of misses the mark because of course research finds that having too much permissions too much a lack of control of a diet, it, it doesn't produce results either because you, you need some rules, you need at least some guidelines for yourself, con some constraints. Otherwise, if I tell you, well, look, you can eat anything as much as you want, that's your diet. Well, then you're going to do exactly what you've been doing, right? So you need to be pointed in a direction. And in that sense, I think it's more important that even though you have rules or guidelines, as you may want to call them, but it's your mindset that is flexible. So you can have a rule, for example, okay, I'm not going to consume any or many starches, which for many people is probably helpful to lose fat, but it, it's not set in stone. So at any day, for example, you can say, well, if we're going out to a nice fancy restaurant, Michelin dining, I'm not going to be the person that's not going to have half of the meals uh, at a restaurant because that one day of the, you know, every month per, I don't know how much, many months you do this, you're, you're, gonna stick to this rule right and in general at any day when you know that you could take a break or you you don't have to do this but it's a choice you've made the decision not to do this a whole different mindset than saying okay i have to do this and that's where the flexibility should come in people that have a very all or nothing mindset what often happens is they break down at some point and they go on binges they um they get yo-yo dieting essentially because they don't have that mindset of making like sustainable incremental changes. Do our kind of conventional dieting tactics factor into people's long-term success or proverbial failure when we look at this rigid dietary control? Well, one example, for example, is with someone's macros. So you say, okay, you give someone their macros. Then a lot of traditional if it fits your macros proponents, which it's kind of, if it fits your macros, flexible dieting has become semi-synonymous in a lot of circles. They would say that the flexibility is that you can fill these macros with any food, but the rule is you have to adhere to these macros. Now, for one, probably having set macros isn't necessary for most people to begin with. You can have ranges of macros that are acceptable, especially as it pertains to the ratio of carbohydrates to fat. For most non-athletes, it's really not that important. Protein also, you can set more as a, minim as a minimum, typically, rather than it has to be this amount. And that gives you a lot more leeway to begin with. But the idea that you have to hit these macros is not a flexible mindset. Rather, a flexible mindset would be you think of your calories as a budget, and this is what you have to spend. You don't have to spend it. Definitely don't force feed yourself if you're trying to lose fat and you're at 1800 calories, but your target is 2100, then great, take that 300 calorie free deficit and move on. And if you didn't manage to stay under your calorie budget, then don't think of it as a failure. Certainly don't think of it as a failure of you, but think of it as a, a learning experience and don't worry about trying to correct that deficit immediately, but rather focus on what can I learn from this? Why did I not adhere to 
the 2100 calories like what did i eat did i eat something that was too caloric did i try to starve myself at lunch and it, it only backfired later what can you learn from this to prevent it in the future and then focus on the future like move on with the plan if you have a meal plan just stick to the meal plan don't go throwing out your the tupperware meals that you made and uh, because you need to rearrange your day because you, now next day you have to eat 300 calories fewer to compensate and end up at the exact target for the week that's also not flexible so that, that's, I think, more of an illustration of flexible mindset versus flexible rules. Yeah. So in that context, you're, you're, you're leveraging sort of your, your perceived mistakes as learning opportunities and identifying, okay, how can I make improvements upon my day-to-day -to, -day to start to make those numbers fit a little more closely in line with you know, whatever my goals are. However, what I'm curious about from your standpoint is if we, if we generally look at you know, things like keto, things like you know, food group elimination or specific food elimination, let's say gluten and dairy as an example. Let's look at, you know, other diets that are rigid in terms of eat this, these foods, never eat these foods. What are we seeing uh, in terms of long-term success, adherence, right? All of those things. I think those diets typically have a, a mixture of one positive and one negative based on what we've been discussing so far where the positive is that they foster adherence or they foster relatedness and thereby adherence. So keto diet, carnivore diet, especially carnivore, you know, it already sounds like I'm going to eat like a lion and you kind of have this feel with the diet. So you feel like when you're eating your all meat diet, it's like, yeah, I'm a lion. I just eat meat. And that, that, that's relatedness, right? But the downside is it's excessively restrictive. I would actually not recommend a carnivore diet for basically anyone. I would say that at least a targeted ketogenic diet would be superior in virtually every scenario. And research also finds that when you have these extremely rigid diets, it, it's not beneficial, even in the best scenarios. Like Atkins, also in terms of long, there was one meta-analysis where they compared a lot of popular diets. And Atkins and Ornish, which is like super high carb and super high fat, they both did a bit worse at the year end, although it wasn't actually that big of a difference because Atkins is still, it does a lot of things right in terms of high protein intake, for example, that other diets don't get right. But basically the trend is these extreme diets, they typically don't do well in the long run. And also this heart restriction, uh, again, it's, it's not a good mindset if you feel like the essence of the diet is not consuming carbs. That's what Atkins essentially says, right? They're trying to make it seem like calories don't matter. It's really uh, just the carbs that matter. And that's a wrong mindset because it's simply factually incorrect. So you're, you have a rule that simply doesn't work and then trying to enforce that rule is you're, you're confusing the means and the end. Like you're in ketosis, you're restricting carbohydrates to reduce your energy intake. So that's also what we see with paleo diets, for example, where people confuse the means and the end. So I eat paleo because paleo makes me lose fat. No, you eat paleo because those are generally whole foods based and not so energy dense food choices with a good amount of nutrients that allow you to get all your micronutrients in, be satiated and naturally end up in energy deficit, which is a form of ad libitum dieting. But then what you see when people don't understand that and they have a factually incorrect rule or a factually incorrect belief about what it is that will get them their goals, they will start eating paleo cookies, um, dry, dried meat, um, paleo, basically all the crap that people eat that makes them fat, but then the paleo version. And then because it's paleo or it's derived from a food that was five processing methods ago, paleo, like really paleo, right? Um, yeah, it doesn't work anymore because you're still consuming super energy dense foods at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it goes back to the whole idea around self-control is anytime we're put in a position where we need to voluntarily restrict and do something that we don't necessarily want to do or be averse to, you know, have to be averse to foods that we actually enjoy that there's no reason they shouldn't be part of a calorically balanced diet. Um, then we put ourselves in a position to have to exert more discipline and willpower and ultimately experience less self-control potentially in the long term. Yes. And that's also why a big uh, part of my book's thesis is that it's not good to try to improve your self-control because that, that also doesn't work. There's nothing to improve. It, it's not like there is this fat that we have to improve. Rather, the best approach typically is the diet that makes you rely the least on self-control. That is, that comes naturally to you. 
that, like I said, with the paleo diet, naturally, if you just eat intuitively, you're going to end up in energy deficit. It's the diet that you don't know that you're on. That's the best diet. Uh, it seems that the people that are the most successful, it's not that they have more self-control or discipline than anyone else. It's simply that they have to exert less self-control. So they put themselves in less positions that require self-control. So right? They're the ones that, let's mm -hmm. say you're trying to abstain from alcohol, you're not spending every night in the bar, right? It's just, it's yes. just logical in that capacity. And of course, we could frame that around food as well. Yeah. So that goes for a lot of things actually in life. There was a great study um, on students where they measured throughout their lives how successful they were in achieving their goals, whether it was weight loss or being more productive for school, getting better grades. And they generally found that Indeed, it wasn't that the students with better self-control did better in achieving their life goals. It was the students that relied the least on their self-control that were more successful in achieving their goals. So structured, focused, and disciplined in that capacity of being regimented mm -hmm. lends itself to um, being more successful in whatever the endeavor is. Yes. And habitual habits are a big part of it. I think it's so relevant for everyone listening because so much of what we talk about and when we kind of get into this with, with clientele is it ultimately comes down to kind of us being a product of our, of our calendar, of our schedule, of the way we prioritize the things that we say that matter to us and that you know revolves around our exercise, taking care of ourselves, sleep, planning our meals, right? And, and, and so on and so forth. So Menno, as we, as we start to delve into um, talking about calories, because we, we're talking about rigid, uh, rigid and flexible dieting a little bit, I'm curious what you've experienced, uh, perhaps what the literature says around the benefits of tracking calories versus not tracking calories, um, especially from a behavior change standpoint, from a, a habitual standpoint. Um, what have you observed in terms of the efficacy for people long-term uh, and, and long-term success? Both can be viable. I think in the very long run, we want to move towards more ad libitum diets. So diets where we're not actively uh, tracking our macros every day and having to come up with a new diet. And typically the approach I find that works the best for people is you start off with calorie tracking and it's, it's not vital, but it is extremely beneficial to at least have, say, two weeks where you're dedicated to tracking everything that you eat because it creates calorie awareness. And it really shows you how big the differences are between, for example, vegetables and bread or things that are already, you know, kind of categorized in most people's mind as both being healthy or good for uh, weight loss. And when you've done that and when you've created a good sense of calorie awareness, then typically what you also find is, hey, this is actually difficult to meet these macros every day and you're spending way too much time like configuring meals that um, suit these exact macros. And then the solution to that, quite naturally, and which works extremely well in research, is having a meal plan. So instead of every day anew trying to reconstruct some type of diet that fits these exact nutritional parameters and that fits this amount of calories, this amount of protein, what you're doing is, you're just creating it once and then you're eating that basically every day. Now you can have multiple options for breakfast, multiple options, or you can have different days with different meals. You can build as much variety in it as you like, but it is scheduled and planned. And importantly, you're, having to, you're making your food choices in advance, which allows you to make them rationally and not rely on self-control, especially when you're hungry. Because when you're hungry and you have to make choices about food, that is the worst possible time. And that's just, even if you can control yourself, why would you want to rely on your self-control all the time to do these things? It's so much easier to do it when you're uh, satiated after a meal, for example, instead of before a meal when you're already hungry and you need to eat something now. And then after that, when you set up a meal plan, it quite naturally develops into a libitum dieting as you can kind of, you know what you're eating and what your general structure of meals are. And then you can kind of, just stop tracking it. And at first, if you're eating the same things every day, you don't have to track it anymore. You know exactly what you eat because it's the same thing every day. And then when you've built in a certain amount of variety and everything, you know how you eat. So you can just follow that same meal pattern and stop tracking it. Right. And maybe at first you make sure that you're still, you get your protein in. Maybe you start with protein and calories and then you stop 
tracking anything except protein uh, or just your fat loss results. And then over time, all you have to do is, okay, how am I eating now? And am I getting the results that I want? I think it is very important for most people to track their body composition change, because if you're not tracking that either, then you're just shooting in the wind, right? But at some point, typically how I add libitum diet and how I transition my clients into it is, okay, at that point, we're not tracking anything anymore deliberately in terms of the diet, but we are still tracking our body composition. And then on a, say, weekly basis, depending on how um, variable your life is, let's say you do weekly measurements and you see, okay, I'm losing fat. Great. That's, so we continue as planned. At some point, okay, I've stopped losing fat. Uh, that means, okay, now we need to reduce your energy intake, but we don't have to track it. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take some of your food choices and replace them with less energy dense foods, more satiating foods. And typically I find that, and research also finds that it works better to focus on adding certain foods rather than restricting foods. So if I tell you or a client, okay, no more pizza, that sucks. But if I tell you, okay, bit of extra broccoli, you're like, I can do that, you know, and then I have my pizza afterwards. But in reality, what happens is you're going to be so full that you're going to eat a lot less of the pizza, or maybe you're going to skip it altogether, and then um, you still get the same result. Yeah, and psychologically, you still know that you get to have the pizza, which in and of itself is is part of helping you be compliant long term. Mm -hmm. You know, in in listening to you, I think what's most relevant, and hopefully what you know our listeners are picking up here, is the importance of having some element of a routine and a habitual process in place. It's yes. like, listen, it's it's not that tracking is the end all be all here, and you're either all in the tracking camp or you're in the quote unquote intuitive eating camp, which two, by the way, go hand in hand. Um, but also is, you know, it's important for you to establish caloric awareness. And by virtue of that, set a routine in place, start to understand your daily behaviors, the foods that you enjoy and how they factor into your results, and then actually be consistent with those. And I think everyone wants to be able to eat out, you know, enjoy lunch out, do all of these different dining out experiences and still reap the benefits of, of fat loss when in reality, it's far too difficult. And it's not that you can't have that here and there, but if you're serious about your goals, it's far too difficult to effectively manage calories when you're relying on other places to prepare your meals, generally speaking. Yeah, it's, I would say that this is something that clients struggle with a lot and it's one of the more difficult skills to learn. And I would say it's, it's kind of the last level to master to be able to go on holiday and to restaurants and still eat at libitum and lose fat or at least maintain your goal physique. It, it's kind of the last step because tracking is inherently basically impossible. As you say, you can make an estimate, but even trained dietitians make big errors. Like 20% error is, is normal. And it makes sense that we cannot estimate the calories in a meal because we don't know what's in it. And we also, there are many things that we cannot see. And if you have the exact same meal, but it has three more tablespoons of olive oil in it, that's a good 300 calories extra. And you don't know, you can't see. I mean, that's for a woman, 300 calories is huge makes a huge difference if you do that with two meals per day and all you you're like how how come i'm not losing fat all that may be happening is that the restaurant you eat at for lunch and dinner dinner lunch at work and dinner at the restaurant or whatever they have these three scoops of olive oil and it's the 600 calories that you don't see that are obstructing all of your progress most definitely and so it's it's very very challenging if you're serious about weight loss and if you're serious about fat loss and you're eating out consistently and you're not sure why you're not losing, um, well, there's a, a very strong likelihood that you're consuming far more calories than you think you're consuming. In fact, I was just having a conversation with a woman yesterday and she, she um, was discussing how her, her naturopathic doctor recommended a certain amount of oil, uh, like Udo's fish oil or something that she consume as well as macadamia nuts for her thyroid or not macadamia, it's Brazil nuts, right? For her thyroid. And when we actually looked at the amount uh, in conjunction with her regular diet, she was well over a hundred grams of fat per day, right? So 900 mm -hmm. calories of fat for a woman who probably shouldn't be eating beyond 15 or 1600 calories for her given weight. I mean, that's pretty darn, con yeah, that's pretty 
pretty significant. That, that's what you get when you have a doctor that um, presumably focuses primarily on the thyroid issues and they're like, oh, selenium and iodine. And they're like, yeah, that's found in macadamia or not, or brazil nuts. You're gonna obstruct your fat loss in a, in a big way, unfortunately. <laughs> So how do you look at it as, as you're taking clients through the dieting journey? Um, how do you start to, and when do you start to look at caloric cycling as a positive option, as a necessary option uh, for, for that client's success? So most research finds that calorie cycling in, in general of most kinds, whether it's via fasting or lower calorie days, higher calorie days, refeeds, diet breaks, it has a neutral effect on diet adherence. So in the end, how we structure our energy intake over time, what matters is the, the average over time rather than how we distribute it over time. Now, there is some research that finds, interestingly, that uh, alternate day fasting type diets actually work slightly better. Now, most research, again, a meta-analysis comes to the conclusion it's neutral. But if anything, I would say the edge is towards like certain days where you have very aggressive diet, um, energy deficits. And then, because that frees up a lot of other days where you can eat more calories. But it's mostly a matter of personal preference, what fits into your diet. If, for example, you, um, you have a family at home and you're cooking for the family and yeah, the family doesn't eat that healthily, then it's just going to be very difficult to have any days probably where you're going to diet extremely strictly. So you're, you're kind of, you have a certain base where, okay, maybe 30% deficit is the max that's feasible. And then other days you do 10% deficit or you just stick with the same deficit on any day. And certain days are just going to be easier. I think if you're working a lot on some days, those are good days to actually be more aggressive with the diet because it keeps your mind off food. And then research also generally finds that people that have social eating events and the like, then you want to free up more calories for those, which of course makes perfect sense because you're more likely to eat more at those times. So what I'm hearing is it really comes down to just net calorie intake here. And there's nothing magical about calorie cycling per se. There's nothing magical mm -hmm. about intermittent fasting or any type of, of, of special, you know, fasting techniques. Um, what we ultimately need is, is a appropriate caloric deficit for that individual. And it sounds like the benefits really come down to that individual's preferences and perhaps the psychology of what works best for them, given their schedule, their responsibilities, their lifestyle, their commitments, all of those types of things. Yep, definitely. Cool. I, I love that. And I think that's such an important topic to hit home on here for our listeners. Listen, again, there's, there's nothing magical, nothing magical about any of these diets that we're discussing. What matters most is long-term adherence. And that's why you need to have autonomy and be empowered to figure out the diet that works best for you, um, the calorie management strategy that works best for you in a way that you can sustain it. Yeah, I would, I would add to that, that like, so general message is there is no such thing as the best diet or, you know, the magical diet. What matters is the diet that works best for you. Uh, but that's not to say that it's completely random or that, you know, everyone has something different. Like there are systemic predictors, for example, of who will um, do better on certain types of diet. Um, for example, with intermittent fasting, we have research that people that are, there's genetic variance in how naturally hungry people are in the mornings. And surprisingly, it's the people that are not so hungry naturally in the mornings, they do better on intermittent fasting. And research finds that if you force those to have a big breakfast, because it's the most important meal of the day, uh, or big early breakfast, because breakfast just means breaking the fast, and that it, it actually sabotages their weight loss efforts because it forces them to well, force feed and consume more calories. Great point. And, and that's something we've definitely observed. I, at least I've observed with clientele um, is, and by that same token, clients that l enjoy eating breakfast and they strategically intermittent fast, it sets them up for disaster later on because then they binge eat the rest of the day and put themselves yep. in a situation. It's not hard to eat far more calories in just an eight hour window than you would have eaten in a 12 hour window, right? Because you didn't eat the meal that you enjoy the most as an example. So I, I think that's a really good point is you need to figure out what actually works for you. And it's okay to experiment. I think one of the best things about, you know, the fact that we have all of these dieting strategies is, is people have plenty of opportunities to experiment 
with what does and doesn't work for them. And then to be able to leverage them as tools, assuming, like you said earlier, is we're using these as learning opportunities and hopefully taking a few and gleaning some insights from them to be able to apply to our own personal preferences. Um, so as we start to wrap things up, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk just a little bit about training here. And um, I guess just, just generally speaking, and, and again, for our general population audience, how do you view strength training and the importance of strength training in the context of weight loss and fat loss, especially related to, you know, same way we're comparing all of these diets, the same way, you know, we'll compare perhaps some of these exercise modalities, spinning, uh, boot camp style classes, mm -hmm. cardio in general. Like, well, what's your outlook on that? In terms of exercise in general, it, it's not nearly as important as nutrition. Most research finds that exercise helps for sure, also because it improves diet adherence and it can uh, increase the satiety of meals. So typically it's, it's kind of a free energy deficit and it doesn't increase your hunger, sometimes even decreases it. And you, you do burn energy during the workout, but it's not nearly as much as most people would like or intuitively think. And as a result, if you're just exercising but you don't do anything with your diet, most people have very limited and finite fat loss success with that. And that's the saying, you can't out-train a bad diet. It's, it's simply very, very true. Now, in terms of, given that exercise is beneficial and that also for health, functionality, fitness, everything, strength training is actually by far the best in research. Like this is, this is something that is extremely counterintuitive, but the meta-analysis by Clark, for example, and multiple follow-up studies on that have quite strongly shown that Given the same time investment, so per minute of exercise, people that start strength training are more successful in losing fat than people that start either aerobic exercise or a combination even of aerobic exercise and strength training. And that's because of multiple reasons. Like the acute energy expenditure during exercise is typically higher with aerobic exercise, cardio, something like that. But the acute exercise ex energy expenditure, as we said, isn't that high to begin with. So it's not the most crucial factor. And then there's some research that indicates strength training is more effective as an appetite management tool. And also it increases your energy expenditure, not just now, but also in the days across. And in particular, when you build muscle and your body weight goes up, that's extra energy expenditure and extra body mass that you're carrying around with you all the time now. And this, is, this takes time, like months to years, but some research that has looked at people like bodybuilders versus uh, untrained individuals, I think they found a 20% higher, even resting energy expenditure. And there are multiple estimates of 5%, 10%. Now that's if you're, cha you're changing nothing in your diet, but you've just built say 5%, 10% extra energy expenditure, that's a 10% energy deficit. And that's gonna last, net you a lot of fat loss over the coming months to years. How do you look at the metabolic implications of more aggressive forms of exercise, particularly like high intensity interval training, um, longer duration, higher intensity cardio mm -hmm. a, and, and fat loss and maybe even adherence as well. Adherence is, is quite variable. Some people prefer one, some people prefer the other. I think there is a trend in research for higher intensity exercise to, um, to eke out, especially in terms of strength training, but again, it's super individual. And in terms of cardio, there's actually some research that people prefer lower intensity cardio because the high intensity interval training just can be so brutal, like Tabata protocols. If done correctly. Sprints. Yes, <laughs> and if not done correctly, then you know maybe better to do something else that you can do correctly. So in that sense, yeah, just very individual, but uh, I would err on the side of strength training if you like it at all being um, most beneficial and yeah, really just finding something that you like doing in general, like even more bigger picture speaking is the most important. Absolutely. And, and just reiterating on reaffirming the importance of strength training here in the grand, in, in the big picture here, especially from a, a fat loss standpoint and a body composition change standpoint for people listening here is, is understanding that exercise while an extremely valuable and healthful tool is not going to be the primary driver of weight loss here. It's going to be your compliance with your nutrition and creating that and, and, and maintaining that caloric deficit. But specifically, if, if you can speak to the metabolic implications of the higher intensity forms of exercise and perhaps 
the implications on like appetite and, and energy regulation in general. Yeah, high intensity exercise typically offers the advantage of being better for appetite management. It's not a big difference in research. It seems to also vary per individual, but the trend is that, or at least I think one, I think three studies have found an advantage of higher intensity exercise. Most find not much of a difference. There's also an advantage in terms of the EPOC, like excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. So basically after the workout, you're gonna build muscle and you've, you've damaged muscle fibers after a strength training or high intensity workout. And in the, the coming days, your metabolism is still going to be increased. Now, it's not that much. Mostly it's under 100 calories, but it does help offset the greater energy expenditure that you would get from something like cardio. And if that's already equal and then you get the other benefits, maybe better appetite management, uh, increasing your long term energy expenditure and building muscle, which is also important for fat loss, because if you're building muscle, that is and not losing muscle as a result, that is energy that you're now not losing anymore in the form of muscle. So you want to lose all the energy that your body is losing in the body from fat. And so any muscle that you lose is not just bad because you're losing muscle, but it's also bad because that's energy that your body is now not burning. It's not burning fat, it's burning muscle. And it's only gonna burn one or the other. You have 500 calorie deficit. If you lose all of that from muscle, which would be terrible, but uh, that's 500 calories of fat that you're not losing. So. At the minimum, maintenance of muscle mass is very important for, to keep your metabolism up because otherwise it's going to decrease your metabolism and it's just going to get more, worse and worse and worse as time progresses. So how cognizant do we need to be about the form of cardiovascular exercise that we're doing? And, and let me just preface and make sure because you are talking about true high intensity interval training in terms of the benefits that you stipulated before. But in my experience, most people are not doing true high intensity interval training, like we, we, you suggested, you know, around exact Tabata type pro protocols, but instead it's a lot of these boot camp style, calling it hit style training, but it's really just jumping around for 45 minutes mm -hmm. doing pseudo strength training, but sort of like the objective is let's see how much you can sweat and how many quote unquote calories you can burn in 45 minutes. Right. Just mm -hmm. so we're clear. Yeah, that's most research finds that those high intensity interval type workouts actually are metabolically much closer to low intensity exercise than to strength training because you just cannot sustain that intensity. And I think it's funny when people do Tabata sprints, like 20 second sprint, 10 second rest, 20 second sprint. Many people think they're training like a sprinter, but you're training like a soccer player because sprinters, they do like 10 second sprint and then five minutes rest, which is a completely different work to rest ratio. And soccer players, those are the ones that do 20 second sprints by the time they're already pretty gassed. So it's like a medium intensity sprint by the, the third sprint. And then they have very short rest periods. And in the end, if you train like that, then well, you're gonna look more like a soccer player in terms of muscularity than an uh, Olympic sprinter. When we go back to the client's preferences, their lifestyle, what's reasonable for them, in my experience for what it's worth, is we have to just look at overall stress load and mm -hmm. um, how much, you know, just total stress load that the client is under to the degree that, again, in my experience, most people prefer to, and it's perceived a less stress to be doing consistent strength training with low intensity cardio, yes. especially given, you know, poor sleep behaviors, a, a very busy job, you know, kids at home, right? All of the things. Yeah. I would, I would say that in general hit like high intensity interval training is more of a short term, I wouldn't say gimmick, but for, for many people that just do it for the fat loss or to look cool, it, it, it doesn't last because it's so stressful. And low intensity cardio, I'm not a big cardio fan, but it's something you can sustain. You know, you can just, you can get to the gym, you can get on your bicycle, you can take a run. It's something that you can do multiple times per week. It doesn't burn you out. You can, you can maintain that. And strength training as well is something you can go to the gym, you do one set, you can rest. You know, it, it's not something that uh, every time after work, I was like, oh, I survived. Thank God. <laughs> well, talk about motivation. I mean, no one, no one is going to be motivated to go do a high intensity workout if they're doing it correctly. So yeah, that's it. Well, some people have a, a masochist, masochistic uh, streak, I guess. <laughs> right. You got to be pretty darn crazy. But uh, again, if, if for most of our listeners, they're not uh, looking for the best high intensity protocol. And if, if they've found it before, they're not searching for it again, assuming they've done it correctly. But um, listen, I, I think that's a, a great place to wrap things up, Menno. So 
I just want to express my appreciation for you taking the time to come on the show. Where can more people find out more about you? Uh, on my website, menohensimals.com. The best way is when you're going on my website, like I said, menohensimals.com, you, uh, at the first you see a free email course. That's probably the best way to get in touch with my contents because it gives you a kind of a tour of my most popular contents, the per content that resonated the most with my audience. And then you can see if you like that and go on either YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and all these channels. And we do have some personal trainers that tune into this uh, podcast. So tell us just very briefly about your personal training certification. Yeah, I have an online course that's now available in French, English, Dutch, Spanish, and German. And it's doing super well. And it's more of an alternative to people that want like a very advanced, in-depth, comprehensive, um, science-based online PT certification. So that's more for the people that are really, um, you know, they want to know all the details, all the studies, and then uh, that will definitely give you everything that you want to know and more about nutrition and exercise science. Beautiful. So for those of you listening, uh, one is thank you for taking the time to, to check out this episode. Um, two is we will have links to both of those, to Menno's email course and the PT certification in the show notes. So just check them out uh, down below and, and go ahead and, and subscribe to that. Uh, and, uh, again, thank you, Menno, for your time much appreciated and, and we'll catch up soon. My pleasure. Take care, brother.